It's 11.41 now, so we'll get started. Irma Jean has kindly shared her screen. If you have any issues viewing it, just please let us know in the chat. And is Doris back yet? I don't think so. Maybe we'll just give one minute for Doris to return and then we'll get started. I am, I am, I am. I oh, you're here. Wonderful. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. No worries at all. Okay, Doris, we will um, let you introduce Barbara for this session. Go for with, it. With absolute pleasure. And I saw Eric now. I haven't seen Eric before. Hi, Eric. Great to see you. Um, so uh, it goes without saying that Barbara Stillwell is, is a household name now that the nursing now has brought uh, to all of us and enrich our lives. Um, I met Barbara um, in relationship to nursing now uh, through um, someone that commented and then it all became a blur, quite frankly, because I decided uh, instead of doing a formal meeting to WhatsApp her. And then we ended up conversing over the WhatsApp and the rest is history. Uh, she has 25 uh, years uh, working in international health. Uh, she worked in, in the workforce, uh, in workforce issues with WHO. Uh, she has worked with ministries. She has worked with um, Nursing Now, uh, now for, uh, a, for since its inception. And she also um, was the instigator of the NP movement in the UK. Um, I want to tell you more than what's in the bio that you can read because it's, it's there, uh, that Barbara is a person of um, tremendous both uh, knowledge, expertise, passion and strategic thinking. And I think it's all of those elements that uh, make her uh, a want to be in your team uh, when you want to think big, when you want to think big, when you want to connect the dots between initiatives um, and whether it is in nursing and otherwise. Um, I had the privilege of being contacted by uh, a, a person in, in uh, Quebec right before the pandemic and then it was cancelled for an event on healthcare and women's issues and I just out of the blue said well you also need to contact Barbara Stilwell I don't know if you know her of course I know her I work with her in WHO and anywhere truly anywhere big and I mean big that you um, speak about big ideas and big movements and big issues that need to be tackled. Uh, Barbara, you're there. You may not be there physically, but when you mention your name, you're there. People know who you are and know you for both your expertise and the seriousness of your commitment. And us here, uh, things don't just happen, colleagues. Whether it is uh, something small or something huge, expertise is one thing, the commitment, the drive, and the strategy to make that expertise come to bear into results for populations is what at the end matters. So mm -hmm. with that, I don't steal any more minutes. I leave you with Barbara Stillwell. You heard, you heard Barbara at, an, at our NEOS AGM. She was spectacular then, and she will be spectacular now. I can go. <laughs> Doris, thank you so much. That, uh, that's just the most wonderful introduction. And thank you really. Um, so I wanted, to, uh, what, what Doris has asked me to talk about today is breaking the glass ceiling. Um, and this was a wonderfully stimulating title. She wanted me to talk about breaking glass ceiling and looking at a brighter future. So when you're as old as dirt as I am, um, you've been through a few of these glass ceilings on your, on your route. Um, and what is really both, it's both inspirational, a bit depressing in nursing, is that they tend to be the same glass ceilings. And I was recently doing a study um, on gender, actually nursing and gender with my old organization, IntraHealth and Nursing Now. And we came to this glass ceiling again. 
So, you know, somebody was saying in this meeting, um, was it Michelle, you're never too old to learn, are you? So I hope. Um, if I ever stop being curious, I think that's the end, going to be the end of the road for me. So in this, this curiosity, gender for me is a subject I've worked alongside um, all my career. But I thought, you know, I'm going to go and find out some more. So um, emboldened by the lockdown and the fact people were doing unusual things, I wrote to a woman called Mary Beard, um, who is, she wrote a book called Women and Power. And that's really stimulated me to think a lot about this glass ceiling and to think about, you know, why do we, why are we talking about this glass ceiling um, many years after you would think we might have tackled it? Uh, next slide, please, Irma Jean. So I'm the executive director of, of nursing now, as you know, and Doris mentioned already the power of social movements. We never set out to have any groups. That was not our intention. Um, and when I started with the campaign in July 2018, we had um, no groups at all. So that's July 2018. Now, November 2020, we have 100, we're in 127 countries with over 700 groups. And to me, what this shows is the power of social movement among nurses at the moment. Um, and this, of course, includes time before the, the pandemic as well. It's not you know, only due to the pandemic, although for sure that has influenced, um, influenced what we have been doing. Next slide, please, uh, Irma Jean. So the reason Nursing Now started was because uh, an all-party parliamentary group here in the UK did a study and what they looked at was what was nursing worth to the world? What was its value to the world? And what they found was that nursing has a triple impact, which won't be a surprise to any of you, I hope. Um, it results in better health for populations. We've talked about that today, you have. Um, it results in a stronger economy because people who are well contribute more to the economy and because more uh, women go into nursing than do men, it also results in more women being part of the workforce. So there's greater gender equity, but also economic benefit, both at family level and also aggregating up to national level. So investing in nursing, is an investment in health and an investment in economy and investment in gender equity. It's a huge investment, which is one of the reasons I say that nursing is a best buy in health. But as we've been talking about today, um, transforming that into change for nursing actually is not, is not easy. Next slide, please. So I wanted to look up, you know, what I've been digging around in for the campaign is why is there a ceiling? And what is it that means that nurses, over all the decades I've been in nursing, we're still talking about how do we influence policymakers, politicians, despite the fact that we have more evidence probably than any other profession in the world about our effectiveness. Um, so I've looked at three things and I'm going to talk briefly about all of these three things. And some of them, the first one, women and power has been, and the second to some extent, very much guided by talking with Mary Beard. And Mary Beard, um, Doris has posted a link to her book and you know, it is such a wonderful book. It's a short book. It's a quick read. And you can also see her talking on the London Review of Books um, website and talking about what's in her book. But she talks very articulately about how women are often overlooked. Uh, in history, for example, um, in things that, you know, in current events. So one of the examples she... Um, 
she uses is um, uh, being a professor herself at Cambridge and how long it took her to actually become noticed as a female professor. I think she, for a while she was the only female professor of classics at Cambridge. So these are the three areas that I've looked at. And, and although it's a, you know, it's a bit of a windy road down this road um, to look at together, I think it might be quite useful in thinking about how do we change things in nursing? So the first one, women and power. Next slide, please. So one of the things Mary Beard had done was she looked up on Google the image of Professor, um, on, you know, to see what came up in Google cartoons. So copying her, I thought, well, that's interesting. So I looked the, at the image of nurses on, um, uh, on Google and um, specifically on the images you can use, cartoon images on slides. This is, this is a selection and a representative sample of the images that came up, uh, which is horrific. You can see Nurse Ratchet is there looking very grumpy and, you know, the nurse with the stockings and the sexy, where does it hurt, you know, and the angel looking all twee. I mean, good Lord, what century are these people living in? And I did this yesterday. So, you know, this is not, I didn't take this from years ago. And I have to tell you, there was only one man among all of these images. Um, and the man actually was a bit of a bit of beefcake. So I was quite surprised about that. He was there flexing his muscles and looking very manly. So I thought, well, at least some things are changing in nursing. Next one, please. So then I looked at the images of doctors. I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. Let's see what the public perceive as doctors. And uh, we have Superman doctor. Um, they're all looking very reasonable and sort of high and what's your next question and aren't they? But there is a mix of women and men, which is really good, I think, representing change. Next one, please. So then I thought I'd look at the images of lawyers just to see how they're doing, um, you know, for, for cartoon images. And of course, there, there are some famous lawyers on South Park, so they got a, a special mention. But you see, they... These guys, they look quite serious, don't they? Obviously cartoons, of course they are, but there's a mix. Um, and, you know, wearing glasses, so clearly they're highly intelligent and, you know, looking, looking very serious, it's like you have to take them seriously. And I think that that is a big contrast with the, with the cartoon images of nursing. Now, I know these are cartoons, but, you know, cartoons influence what the public think about nurses. Um, these are what they'll find if they go and look online for something to put in a presentation, for example. Next one, please. So if we think about women and power, we now know from State of the World's Nursing that nine out of 10 nurses worldwide are women. It varies from region to region. And in Africa, there are more men uh, in some countries than women. Uh, in fact, I think the ratio is three women to one man in Africa. Um, so it clearly varies by region, by country. But if you take the overall global figures, 90% of nurses worldwide are women. Nursing is clearly a gendered occupation. And the work I've been doing with IntraHealth and Nursing Now has been looking at what influence this has on nurses and power. Um, so women and power, nurses and power. Here you see uh, our dear friend Florence. The only thing Florence Nightingale is remembered for is carrying that blessed lamp. Whereas in fact, what she did was far, far more far reaching than carrying the lamp. I mean, she actually invented um, pie charts she was, you know, the most incredible, she was the first woman member of the Royal Society of Statistics. But who remembers her for that? You know, we remember her for going around with the lamp, which was a very important function, but it wasn't everything that Florence was about. And it's not everything that nursing is about. Next one, please. 
So I've got just three slides from Jane Salvage's wonderful library on um, nursing images. This is one uh, from the Red Cross in the First World War, the greatest mother in the world they were going to recruit. So this said, of course, at that time, there were no men in nursing and you can see why, um, you know, if it was only attractive to the greatest mother in the world, that's all you needed to be. Next one, please. And this one isn't much better. The best nurses have the essential qualifications before they go to school. Well, no, they don't. Um, you know, they only get the qualifications by actually going to university. And we've been talking today about advanced practice nursing and the, and the doctorate in nursing practice. You know, we have to, we have to somehow get this advertisement changed. Um, it's not about being a little girl and playing with the dolls. Heavens, it isn't. Next one, please. And nothing would be complete without sexy nurse. Um, this was photographed in Hong Kong in 2011. Um, and as you saw in the cartoon images, you know, that still is um, an image that's out there. So the next one, please, uh, Irma. So why does this matter? Well, this matters because the general public um, have gendered expectations and perceptions about nurses. And when we reviewed for the study we did, children's literature around the world, and this included um, countries in Asia, in Africa, what we found was that it was only little girls in these children's books that were shown to be nurses and teachers. And the little boys, were shown to be engineers and doctors. So, and you know, we find here that little boys are given doctors sets to play with and little girls are given nurses caps to put on and nurses sets to play with. More seriously here, although I do think the cultural exposure is very, very important. Um, and uh, um, we need to be much more savvy about how we are seen in both books, television, um, films. You know, how often have you seen a nurse speaking in Grey's Anatomy? Possibly once, and that might have been to ask the doctor to go out to do something. But, you know, they, they get nothing, they're nothing. The doctors do everything. And there's that one nurse in the theater, um, and she's the one I pick up every time I watch this, and she hands instruments to people and looks a bit, cheesed off sometimes but that's it you know so how is this representing what nurses do around the world so that cultural exposure is very important nursing is also not typically included as a stem subject which i found appalling when i found this i discovered this um, it's seen as a soft skill so when they counted the number of women doing science, technology, engineering and maths in England, uh, and they looked at whether the men or women, they found a really low number of women. And so um, the nursing faculty said, well, you know, we've got 90% women here. Why, where are we? And they said, oh, we don't include you in STEM subjects. So... Thinking about nursing as a soft skill has got ramifications. Next slide, please. And this is from uh, Mary Beard. She says, women are still perceived as belonging outside power. So the shared metaphors we use are female access to power, knocking on the door, storming the citadel, smashing the glass ceiling, or just giving them a leg up, underline female exteriority. So in other words, there's no expectation, you know, that women will have, have if you like, the voice to rise. Um, and Mary Beard says, you find women where the power isn't. And that is very, very critical for us to remember when we're thinking about bringing, bringing about change, I think. Next slide, please. We have to think differently about the power that we have and the power that we want. And, you know, this word mansplaining has come, come into the, the um, common parlance. And, 
you know, I, I mean, we, we use it a lot jokingly, but there is, um, you know, if you think back to the US Congress and Elizabeth Warren and um, trying to read the letter that she was trying to read in, uh, in Congress, and she was told she couldn't do it. But later, a couple of the blokes got to read this letter. So you've got to ask yourself, what were, what were the inherent grounds for this? Um, and why are our women's voices so hard to, to get heard? I think that's one of the powers of nursing now is that it's become this collective voice. Um, did you know that Black Lives Matter was started by three women? And, you know, nobody, hardly anybody knows their names. Their names were Alicia Garza, Patrice Colors, and Opal, Opal Tometi. That was their, that's their names. Um, but we, you know, they're not tripping off our tongue, are they? Um, but what Mary Beard points out is there's no need for those of us who want to make a change to have celebrity status. You can still do it. And this is one of Doris's messages. We can still make change. You know, we have to chip away at the places that we, we can change. And I believe we have to learn to be difficult. We're terribly, terribly nice as nurses. That's one of the reasons I love working with nurses. I love meeting them. You can have a good discussion. You can talk about all kinds of things. Um, but, you know, we have to learn to be not quite so nice sometimes and actually make sure that our voices get heard, particularly when we have a good message to share. Next slide, please. So medicine and pap, and this is why uh, this, the idea of nursing being a soft skill uh, becomes important. Now, Celia Davis wrote this back in 1985. She said, there's a sense in which nursing is not a profession, but an adjunct to a gendered concept of a profession, which is an interesting phrase. Nursing is an activity, in other words, that enables medicine to present itself as a masculine and rational profession and gain the power and privilege of doing so. So she's saying that medicine has had the first bite of the cherry in defining its, its work. Um, and it was interesting to me that when we had this discussion with Mary Beard, who of course is a classicist and not a nurse, we were explaining to her, this small group of us, you know, the challenges in nursing and how we wanted to give nursing a voice like women have a voice. And she said, well, one of your problems is, she said, that when people think about nursing and medicine, they think about medicine. And doctors do what doctors do and nurses do whatever is left over. Which, of course, is far, far from the truth. Um, but it's interesting that Celia Davis said this too, um, you know, the aspects of, of health and healing that are left over and medicines impose this sort of vision. Of, of course, this was written a long time ago, decades ago, but there was that sort of sense at that time that medicine was kind of scientific and, you know, all of that. Um, and nursing was soft and caring. And if you were a nice woman, essentially, you could be a nurse. Uh, hence the advertisements. Uh, and this sounds a bit as if I'm demonizing men, which I really don't want to do. I'm really talking about concepts of, you know, concepts of where power lie. And um, I think one of the things we need to think about is how do we change the perception of our colleagues in medicine about what nurses do and who nurses are. And one of the things we have learned over this pandemic, and interestingly, we learned it from China, um, was that when the nurses stepped up in the intensive care unit and were allowed to do what they did there, the doctors were staggered. The doctors actually said in China, we could not have treated as many people as we did unless the nurses were there. 
And, you know, I think that realization is critical because we need to be working as a team, but each of us, each of us to be really cost effective, we need to be working to the top of our license. And what often happens is we're pushed down, um, you know, it becomes a struggle when really we should be supporting each other to work to the top of our license. Next one, please. And I think one of the problems for us, it's a strength and it's also a challenge, is that we practice, what we tend to practice is adaptive nursing, which I've called the art and science of the possible. So when we see a gap, we think about, you know, we've been talking about innovation in this session. We think about what can fill this gap? What can we do to fill this gap? Um, we see opportunities especially, you know, RNAO, it's always seeing opportunities. I see the papers, I see the tweets from Doris. You're in there, you know, what are the opportunities? And we take on new tasks. And when I introduced the nurse practitioner role to the UK, we took on a load of new tasks. In fact, they said the only reason it was really um, successful was because doctors hated stringing ears. So they were very happy to hand that over to the nurse practitioner. Um, so, you know, we take on these things. So it looks as though we can take stuff on and glue it to ourselves. And we need to be much clearer about saying that this process of adaptation, of adoption, of looking at what's possible is actually a skill. Um, and it's about applying the science of nursing to changing circumstances and contexts. And we need to be thinking about how we explain that, you know, in ways that um, are going to make sense to people looking in from outside. Next one, please. So we need to define what we do now in its totality. And I think that means we need to start speaking different languages. We need to speak in the languages of science. And we do that through research and we do good research that we can explain. And I think, you know, we're there with that. Um, but we also need to take on big data. So um, my colleague, Alison Leary, analysed um, 23,000 care pathways for patients with lung cancer. And what she found, this is from big data, what she found was that patients who were allocated a nurse at the start of their treatment lived longer than people who weren't. Now, of course, there's no cause and effect in this. It's association using big data. But isn't it powerful? And we need to be on top of this. We need to be grasping these big data. What are they associated with? What difference does it make if you have a primary healthcare practice that's two doctors and 10 nurses or five doctors and five nurses? What difference does that make? Who comes, you know, and why? We need to get much better at, at speaking these languages, the languages of the science, the art of what we do, how we adapt, um, what our outcomes are, and we are good at that. And we need to get good at talking to politicians and we need to speak the language of politics. And it's hard. It's hard because we're all busy. Um, you know, we don't always have time to keep up with what's going on in, in the world out there. Um, but, you know, it's critically important if we're actually going to change anything that we do know uh, what's going on out there. And I did ask a class I was teaching, um, you know, who, how many of them read a newspaper, not one of them put their hands up, read a newspaper every day. We have to start doing that. We have to be on top of the politics. Next one, please. State of the world's nursing has 20 policy options, all from a health labor market perspective. And they align very nicely with the report we've been discussing today. They're all in there producing more, educating them, diversity, financing, migration, performance, which is all about management, gender, working conditions, all of those things, and regulation. They're all in there. And this is a, well, certainly once in my lifetime opportunity for us to hold our ministers accountable for putting these uh, policy options, for at least considering them vis-a-vis -vis nursing, putting them in place. Next one, please. So we need to be telling a new story of nursing um, for all of us. And 
this i believe has to be around a social movement this has to emulate me too black lives matter this is us standing up and saying enough it's enough we have the evidence we know it's nursing is very effective it's cost effective we know the challenges and we want to engage in data dialogue decision pathways we want to bring you the data we want to talk about it and we want to help you make good decisions at a political level and that's where we and th this is exactly what Florence Nightingale did um, you know with her statistics uh, you know she she collected the data and she took it back and that's what set her apart I think for a woman of her time um, you know it wasn't only the care she gave and there were other people who were giving care like Mary Seacole for example who were giving care um, the frontier nurses and so on who were getting out there but what Nightingale did was she used her sphere of influence she went back to England where she was well connected to politicians to you know ministers and she took the data she turned it into pictures so they could understand it poor things and she showed it to them and she said you need to change and you know that is the that's the influence i believe we need to get into next please next one thank you no that did we miss oh no is this an x okay um so some lessons we have learned uh, from the campaign over the last few years, last three years, confident leadership is really key. Um, and by that, we mean giving people, giving people the data, the messages that they can use when they're speaking to politicians, to other people outside nursing. Organization advocacy is great, but it doesn't have to be official. You can just, you know, have a group in your school and school of nursing, university, hospital. You can become influential that way as long as you focus on your impact. And we believe it's absolutely critical to involve young nurses in this, which is why we started the Nightingale Challenge. Um, and the reason is, of course, because we ought to be developing them, but also um, because they have a different mindset, certainly to me. They have different expectations, which are good. You know, they, they're not going to sit back and just sort of be a, somebody hiding in a corner, as I probably was, I think, when I was a student nurse. Um, but, you know, they're going to be more assertive and they're going to say what they want and they want a good work-life balance. Um, they really, really want to be um, uh, uh, enabled to do a good job. And, um, you know, we need to support them in that. Next one. So this is a quote I find by Florence Nightingale. And I love this. Um, Nursing is a very serious, delightful thing like life, requiring training, experience, devotion, a power of accumulating instead of losing all these things and that i think speaks to what um patricia benner talked about from novice to expert we accumulate we don't lose these things and it also speaks to us being able to mentor young nurses coming in so they don't lose those things either um you know that their, their experience their training they should value it and we should value it and help them to value it next so that's it it's been a great pleasure to talk to you um, from this global perspective and uh, i hope i've given you some ideas to uh, think about when you're thinking about impact thank you doris Thank you, Barbara, and I will make just a few comments and then open for questions, uh, some of them in the chat already. Um, two things, one about um, how do we ask doctors to see nurses uh, separate? I would also, I would almost ask, turn the microphone on, off, because I don't want the dogs to hear this. Um, we don't need to ask. Doctors will never give up power as others, let me say this, white nurses will not give power away.
to black nurses, which is another problem. When you look at the books, you were showing books, Barbara, and when you look at the books, and we have discussed this in the um, anti-racism against black nurses uh, task force in our own profession, whether it's in Canada, the US or wherever it is, every one of us are this when we have power, this color. So the same as white nurses don't make space to black nurses. If we are going to wait for doctors to ask permission, ain't going to happen. Certainly not in Canada. So we can have allies, like we learn in the black nurses movement. We can have allies amongst doctors that want to join with us forces. But Florence Nightingale, remember, she never waited for anybody. Never, ever, ever, ever. In fact, one time she gave her statistics to someone else to present because women were not allowed to present. So when Sally, I think it was Sally, someone asked in the chat, we need to become more assertive, but how we go about it? Let me tell you how I went about it. You just do it. The first time, uncomfortable. Second time, ah, not so. 50,000 times you love it and you don't give a whatever about if the other side cares or not as long as you're talking truth to power, as long as the patient, the community, and that's what Barb is talking, and society is at the center. So it's not just the difference that we need to make compared to some other professions, organized medicine, I'm talking not individual doctors, because actually I know formidable individual doctors, but organized medicine. In organized nursing, we need to make one big difference and it's at the core of who we are. The big needs to be bigger than that person or that association or that organization. We will be winners and conquer the fear because conquer the fear. Ask Corsita, that is the co-chair of the Black Nurses Anti-Discrimination Task Force. At the beginning, she had Think. We need people to conquer the fear and go for it. And I hope in the last session, Barbara, we will be able together to rally that and create that message, nursing and then peace and arrangements, et cetera, are the best buy in town. So let's open for questions. Uh, Catherine, you want to moderate the questions? Sure, Doris, I'm more than happy to. Thank you. Meanwhile, that you find questions, Barbara, I didn't know, and I tweeted about that. I didn't know about the doctors in China had to recognize that. That's beautiful. It is, isn't it? It was in an article that they sent me to review. That's um, beautiful. Yeah, and we actually featured them on a webinar. Um, That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay, so Barbara, we have a first question coming in from Juliet S. How come in nursing we do not speak about Mary Seacoil as she was a pioneer herself? Always Florence Nightingale. Yes, it's quite true. And um, I was actually asked to go and present the prizes at the Mary Seacoil um, award ceremony here in London, which I was very proud to do. And because I was doing that, I did a lot of reading about her life. Um, and essentially, she had a very different trajectory from Florence Nightingale. And her goal, um, her goal really was to provide care to the, the soldiers in the Crimea, which she did very effectively. Um, whereas Florence Nightingale's goal was really to, you know, she set about to be a change agent. And I think maybe that's why um, she was remembered, although now, we do have a statue in London to Mary Seacole, and so we should, um, you know, because she represents, she did, um, uh, she went on a different pathway, but we all have our, con you know, none of us know where our piece of the jigsaw is going to fall. Um, we just have to carry it and find the right place for it. It's just that Nightingale's place, I think, for us today. If Nightingale lived today, she wouldn't be the woman with the lamp. She'd be the woman with the spreadsheet. And, you know, she would be going to the G20 summit with her spreadsheet to tell them why they should give a million dollars 
to invest in every country in nursing. That's what she'd be doing now. Um, you know, and so we have to remember that. That's that influential leadership. I mean, she wasn't perfect. She was a young woman of her time. She was privileged. She had a lot of attitudes that I'm sure, you know, we wouldn't want to see today. However, she was feisty. And it's that feistiness, you know, we want to be disruptors like, like Nightingale. Yeah, somebody said in the chat she had a head start because she was white and privileged. She did. Indeed, she did. But she used it for good. You know, I will say that she used it for change um, and good on her, not to denigrate anybody else. Thank you, Barbara. There's another question and some comments in the chat regarding how nurses can assert themselves um, in a professional manner, because we often have the image of being nice and we need to start shifting that um, <laughs> and really be able to assert ourselves when needed. Can you speak to how we can do that effectively at all? You know, um, when I was a lot younger, we used to have, I can't believe I'm talking about this. We used to have something called assertiveness training um, where we all learn to be ass assertive women. And I'm beginning to think we should start doing it again. Um, because I think these days, some, I've had this as a boss, you know, some people have come to me and said that certain people are uh, aggressive, young women, usually, um, occasionally young men. But, you know, they're not aggressive. They just say what they think. And, you know, I come from a generation where nobody said a single thing that they thought. In fact, it's, a, it's, it's um, like a legend here in, in England. Um, there's a whole, there's a, a store that sells things online um, about what, when British people say things, what they actually mean, as opposed to what, you know, what it says. So um, if it says, you know, uh, I'm going your, why are you going my way? Um, you know, every, what a British person really means is, please, God, don't let them be going my way. Because, um, you know, British people are supposed to be very reticent and so on. So younger people now have, are, are speaking their minds. And hurrah, it, you know, but we need to learn how do we deal with that? How do we not see that as aggressive behaviour, but just see it as speaking your mind? So we both need to learn... Some of us need to learn how to do it, um, and some of us need to learn how to hear it, I think. Thank you so much, Barbara. That's a great response. My last question for you that came from the chat was, during the pandemic, the Ministry of Health announced more beds. However, one sec. And some yeah. of... Just one sec. And I think, Barbara, one thing to add to that comment is some of, some of us need to help those that are trying to be assertive and are being, and are being accused of aggressive to stand up for them and say, sorry, would you say that if this was a gentleman? Yes. Or yeah. sorry, uh, Corsita is saying something very important. Catherine is saying something very important. Yeah. Eric is saying something very important. You know what I mean? We need to stand up as glued again for that because it's very, once they, once you, once you suffocate that voice once, it's very difficult for people to again, try again. That's so true, Doris. And I would say that this is one area where our male colleagues can really step up and support us. One of the most affecting things that ever happened to me was I, was saying something in a meeting that was mostly men. Um, I think it was only one other woman. And I was saying something and one of the men just cut me off. And one of the other men said, um, excuse me, I think Barbara hadn't finished what she was saying. Could you please let her finish? And I was so touched by that. I just thought, what a wonderful thing to do. And, you know, I think what we need is uh, the men who are in nursing, you know, the poor old 10 percent, we need to have them as our allies and friends to support us in finding our voice. Thank you. So we'll end with just one comment then, which was regards to um, the Ministry of Health actually opening up more beds for patients uh, due to the pandemic. However, there were no nurses um, added 
to actually staff those beds. Um, so if you have any final comments, Barbara, on how nurses can effectively advocate to ensure that the numbers are there when caring for patients um, and, and how to really do that um, in a way that's strategic um, and that really is, is assertive, like you had said. Um, any, any advice? Well, I think, you know, when I, there's a couple of things spring to mind. When I was at WHO, um, I used to work in the health systems department, although I was a workforce specialist, but I worked in health systems. And one of the things we used to try to point out to countries was that it was absolutely no use having a big shiny hospital if there were no people in it, you know, no people to run it, no nurses, no physicians, which is what happens in low income settings. And it was like having a big fleet of buses, which were all shiny and new, but no drivers, um, you know, so they're only as good as, as how you use them. The equipment, the facilities, they're only as good as how you use them. Um, and we have a lot of evidence that shows that, that the more qualified nurses are, the better the care is going to be. And nurses are patient safety critical. You know, there is no doubt they are patient safety critical. So we need to be also um, making sure that politicians hear these messages, but that the public lobby for them too. You know, if you go to a hospital, there's no nurses there, nothing's going to happen to you. Nothing at all. Um, and it's, you know, it's too simple for people to understand in a way. So it doesn't matter how many lovely, you know, when they built the Nightingale hospitals here, as they call them um, during the pandemic, you know, they staffed a couple of thousand beds in emergency centers, um, but then they had to find people to go and work in those centers because the beds on their own weren't gonna nurse the patients. So, you know, you've got to help people make those, um, connections really it's almost too simple to see but you know you can have a lovely big shiny bus but without a driver a bus ain't going nowhere thank you barbara so now we're going to conclude the session that was just such a wonderful uh, presentation barbara and we're so delighted to have you here today we would like to ask our participants to please engage in another poll so that we can get some feedback and um, help us again to consider um, any suggestions for next time. So we'll take a couple of minutes to do the poll. Following that, we will move into a lunch and learn session where we will hear from five NPs working across sectors and settings to tell us a little bit about their role and how they worked uh, during COVID. And thank you again, Barbara. Um, Catherine. Yes. As I was doing the poll, it just took, it cleared before I could submit. Did it clear? There is a way for it to repopulate. I think Lauren had suggested in the last session. Lauren, is there a way for the poll to be repopulated if it's gone? Um, yes, Erica um, posted it. I'm just going to scroll up and see. I didn't close it. I think it may be because there's a couple of us as the co-hosts. Um, if you lost the polls, you can click on more and polls. Can you post it again? Yeah. Well, that would be easier for people.
Um, for those of us that may think on some of your events, I want to make a comment that I just uh, WhatsApp you, Barbara, but I think it deserves to be public. It's it's both the passion and the style of presentation as it is the amount of preparation that Barbara does for every talk that really impresses me till no end, till no end. Uh, you truly dedicate a lot of hard work, Barbara, to doing research about the topic you are presenting. And please know that it's appreciated, it's noticed, and it's celebrated. Thank you, Doris. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to have that appreciated because I feel I always feel it's important for you know to for to do to do justice to whoever's asked me to do something. So, so thank you. Uh, I, you know, this is in a tape, and I wonder if we send you a transcription of that of this talk, if you can transform it into either an article for the journal, seven hundred words. That's all. Because really, here you are reaching 130 people. An article will reach 100,000 people. And then yes, I will be happy. Yeah, very good. of course. Very, very good. Thank you. It's just, it just was an amazing talk. An amazing talk. Thank you so much, Irma Jean, for now sharing the lunch and learn slides. We'll now invite you all to join us while you have some lunch and take a little bit um, of a break to eat, um, but to also learn during that time and hearing from five dynamic nurse practitioners who, as I mentioned, are working across all different areas of the health system. I'll pass it on now to Alyssa, uh, who is going to be moderating the session. Thank you so much, Alyssa, and please go ahead. Um, okay, uh, so great. I'm actually really, look, oh, hold on one second. Let me just get my video going here. There we go. Um, I'm actually really looking forward to this, to hearing about, you know, kind of day-to-day -day practice or otherwise a day in the life of NPs in, in um, Ontario. So um, I'd like to get started. And I, and I just wanted to let you know, I do have bios and I think what I'm going to do is I will um, present the bio of each individual and I'll have them talk a little bit and then 